How do ETFs make money off you, even if you don't deal with them directly? Can ETFs go bankrupt? What? There's a risk-free way to make money? Where's that? And if an ETF announces a shutdown, what should you do? So stick around for the whole video and I'll give you two tips on what to look out for so you don't have to deal with that problem. Hi everyone, welcome back. By the end of this video, you're gonna learn a ton about ETFs. A quick look at Fidelity's website. You have active ETFs, thematic ETFs, factor, sector, bond ETFs. It's a lot to take in, but if you're new to the ETF world, it's just a fund that's kind of like a stock. It ticks, it moves, you can easily buy and sell through your broker, except that it's not one stock, but it's a fund. A supermarket basket is the best analogy. A basket for your bread, milk, yogurt, that kind, except this time, what's in the basket is stocks, bonds, gold, or even Bitcoin. And if you're into crypto, don't forget to hit that like button. It's really going high as I talk about my price prediction in this video here. Anyways, coming back, the big difference between this ETF basket and the supermarket basket is that there's someone called an ETF manager. He or she will do the picking of what goes in the basket, so you don't get that choice. But though what you get to choose though is whether you wanna buy it or ignore it. So one basket is one unit of an ETF, and many, many baskets make up the whole ETF, the whole fund. And if you're wondering what's the difference between ETFs and index funds, I have a whole explainer video here. So check that out later if you want. Let's talk about how ETFs exchange traded funds make money. Yes, you often do see fees and expense ratios like this on this page here, but no one really explains it. The funds, they don't take money from your bank, they don't charge you a commission, and it's not subsidized by your broker. So how do they earn these fees? Picture a basket that you've picked out of a supermarket and it's full of milk. 100 liters of milk. That's a lot of milk. So let's assume the ETF fee for this milk basket is 1% per year. So how this work is, the ETF manager earns the money through the net asset value. And what that means is, it's like you own the milk basket. The ETF manager still gets to drink from it every year because he manages it. So it's like he gets to take away 1% of 100 liters, which is one liter. So I have simplified this because we're just talking about the unit volume of the ETF when you also really need to take into account the price as well. That's how you get the net asset value. But the ETF manager drinking milk from this milk basket, I think that's really clear enough on how they make money from your basket. So that's how this fee works from this page. They don't charge you directly. It's all indirect, but some fees of ETFs are so small that you don't really feel it at all. Which is why a lot of people say ETFs are a really cheap way to invest. But have you ever wondered who the ETF APs are? No, not apps, not apes, but APs, short for authorized participants. Don't get confused by the name. Authorized participants, they're not individuals like you and I. They're actually big financial institutions, like these companies here. So why I mention them is, even though they're invisible to you, but they play a hugely important Important role in the ETF creation and redemption process. I know those are big words, but I'll explain in a second. And why are the authorized participants here? It's because they're in the game to make riskless profits. And if you get close to people in finance, making riskless profits is like the pinnacle achievement in finance. How to print money without losing any. So APs are between you and the ETF fund manager. So again, we're on the Fidelity's website. Warning, to be clear, this is not investment advice. I do not own this ETF myself. And Fidelity is also called the ETF sponsor, which means ETF manager, they're the same thing. But the manager is different from the AP, although they could still be part of the same group. Confused? It's kind of like being a supplier to your own restaurant. It's kind of related, but they play different roles. After all, to run a restaurant, you probably need multiple suppliers, which is exactly like an ETF where they would have multiple authorized participants as well. On different ETF websites, you usually see different terms. ETF fund sponsor, ETF issuer, ETF manager. Basically, they're referring to the same thing. They're responsible for putting things in that basket. So do ETF managers pay the authorized participants? No. APs are not paid by the ETF manager. They are liquidity suppliers to that ETF and make money from the market. Here's what I mean and you understand an ETF creation process along the way. Let's say the ETF is made up of 30 different stocks and each costing $1. So the total value of all these stocks in this market is 30 times $1, which is $30. This $30 is the fund's net asset value, NAV. NAV information will always be displayed for any ETF website, like here. So getting back to our example, if this fund's NAV is $30, the value of the basket, you might think the price of this ETF, the fund on the stock market, should also be $30, right? Yes 
and no. But usually it's a very tight relationship and it's because of the authorized participants. They make it like this. So remember the fund we have here, these stocks are all individually traded as well. And because markets are markets, some of them start trading for $1.10, while others can start to be trading for 80 cents or 90 cents. And eventually you could get to a situation where the NAV of the fund adds up to $29.50. This is an opportunity for riskless profit, what we call in finance and arbitrage. Because the authorized participant sees the price of the ETF is still at $30 on the stock market. So there's a 50 cents to be made here because the NAV AV is lower, is at $29.50. So the only thing that the authorized participant needs to do is to buy one share of all the stocks in this basket, which will cost him $29.50. The AP then can deliver them to the ETF sponsor, which let's say in this example is Fidelity. And here the ETF manager will take all the shares and issue one unit of the ETF which represents the basket of shares that was received from the authorized participant. After that, as a last stage, the authorized participant can sell this ETF on the market, perhaps to you, for $30 to earn a cool 50 cents in profit, almost at no risk. So what we just described here is the ETF creation process and the authorized participant will keep doing this, keep getting new ETF units until the price is close between the $29.50 of the NAV and the market price of $30. Can you see how they're providing liquidity and earning this riskless money every time? But there's also the ETF redemption process, which I won't get into too much detail because it's basically the same. Just that the AP would do the buy and sell, but in reverse order. But growth processes, the creation and the redemption process are super important for ETFs. That's how they keep the ETF NAV and the ETF price pretty close. But when things are a little off, that's when they actually step in. So you're very likely to see the ETF premium or discount on fund manager websites. And usually ETF issuers want this number to be as small as possible because it means they're doing their job properly. That's why a few months ago, Grayscale Bitcoin Fund got so much heat, even though it's not an ETF, which I explain more in this video. Again, check it out when you're free because the price of the fund was like 10 to 20% lower than the NAV. If I was an investor in that fund, I would be angry too. So in the beginning of this video, I did say ETFs trade very much like stocks, which they are, but stocks go bankrupt. So do ETFs go bankrupt and get delisted? So the ETF manager can go bankrupt. So the person who puts things in the basket, the individual items, the stocks in the basket can also go bankrupt. But the fund itself, the basket, not really, but it can still get delisted from the market. So it won't be tradable anymore. In fact, up to mid-October, at least 200 ETFs has already closed shop for the year, according to ETF.com. So in 2019, around 120 ETFs got delisted. And around 2018, that was around 150 or so. And there's many reasons why they actually do. The ETF could have too little assets. It just doesn't generate enough money to cover the cost. Or maybe it's a rather unpopular ETF in a very saturated market. There's too many competition. Maybe it's poor management or just poor performance. But the more important question is, what should you do if your ETF is going to shut down? Hold on, wait, wait. The good news is, your fund will always give you a fair warning before your ETF closes down for good or gets withdrawn from the market. It's usually never like a company stock, which they suddenly declare bankruptcy and can surprise you. There's more warnings for funds. Typically, the firm will issue a press release. They'll let the whole market know and they'll file supplementation document with the regulator. So here, let's say it's the SEC, 30 to 60 days prior to the closure. So what happens during this time is that the ETF firm, the manager, will liquidate the fund. They will sell all the items in the basket in this process. So at the end, if you're still holding onto the ETF, then you will receive cash value of your shares at the pre-announced time of liquidation. Then should you actually wait to actually get paid? Here's the big tip. No, not a good idea. What will actually happen is the fund will have to pay tax on the assets. It means the cash that you will receive will always be after tax payment. That means less cash for you for your unit. So it's not a good idea to wait for the ETF to liquidate. So I have final three tips 
to how to avoid situation like this. The warning sign. So it does depend on the stock market, but if we're talking about the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, if an ETF has less than 40 to $50 million in assets, that's quite small. It means that the funds will not be generating enough fees to actually cover its own cost. Warning sign one. The second warning sign is very thinly traded. It's got very little liquidity. So if you don't see the ETF price move at all, the spreads are wide, big red flags on liquidity, the second warning sign. And most importantly, is the last warning sign. Is please, please, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments below. Happy investing.